and welcome to Stories Found. Each week we feature funny stories, plays, and sketches from some of the most talented comedy writers in the world. I'm your host, Ava Love Hanna, a writer and humorist in Austin, Texas. Joining me is my writing partner, audio engineer, and all-around cool guy, Paul Hanna. You're listening to Stories Found. Our featured organization this week is the Catskill Mountain Foundation. The Catskill Mountain Foundation believes that art can transform the lives of those touched by it, and so they aim to combine high-quality performances, artist residencies, and arts education in a multifaceted program. Find out more about the Catskill Mountain Foundation, their programs, and how you can help further their vision at catskillmtn.org. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Stories Found. This week we're featuring the very, very funny 10-minute play, A Great Fall, by Christian Masonic. Christian is a New York City-based playwright originally from Chicago, where he was a graduate of Columbia College and the Second City Conservatory. He's had plays produced all over the country, including one of our very favorite theaters, Mad Lab. Christian is hilarious, a fantastic writer, and we're so excited to have him here today. Hi, Christian. Welcome to Stories Found. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Well, we're really excited to have you here to talk about your play, A Great Fall, which, as I understand it, is a serious and thoughtful melodrama about (laughs) enjoying the autumn of one's life, right? (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) No, so I actually did read your script, and it is hilarious. But so without giving too much away, tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Yeah. So without kind of spoiling something that I I think it's better not to spoil, Mm -hmm. it's about um, someone who is in the hospital uh, having suffered an injury that he believes to be due to some sort of municipal uh, malfeasance that he wants to (laughs) kind of write, you know, have his story told in the press and kind of uh, draw attention to, um, you know, what's going on. And the press has decided to go a different way with it. Um, and kind of exploits his story in a strange way. <laughs> that's, that's that's actually perfect. That's the perfect description. <laughs> and now we obviously love comedies here. But this play is it's just really something special. It's a fantastic parody, almost a pastiche even of a of a well known children's story. And I love plays that retell familiar stories in expanded or novel ways. So tell me, how did you get this idea? Yeah. So um, I think a year or two back, I was doing this um, uh, thing with the, I think it's called the Playground Theater. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they have branches kind of in in New York where I'm based. And Mm -hmm. then I think in uh, California, Chicago, uh, where every month there's like a pool of writers and every month there's a different prompt um, for, uh, you know, submit your little 10 minute play about blank. And then they would choose um, six or so to develop into little plays for that month. Um, so I had been doing that for a while and the prompt, I, I, I feel like if I gave the prompt away, that would also, <laughs> yeah. um, but it was, uh, looking for plays in a very specific genre, mm-hmm. a very, uh, classic time honored genre. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, you know, th- th- that's not something I don't, I don't generally write um, that specific genre of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so to try to deconstruct it, I thought about, um, I- I'm hardly the, the kind of the central premise of the, it's hard to, I- I'm like speaking in riddles. In uh, it's okay. To avoid <laughs> giving it away. But the central premise, like the, the oddity between um, the actual details of a certain well-known story mm-hmm. and how it's generally perceived has, I'm certainly not the first one to, um, point that out, but it's always been something that's really delighted me and mm-hmm. how strange it is that we all take this one aspect of the story for granted, despite <laughs> it not, uh, in any way, shape or form being part of the story. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I, I wanted to, I, I tried to look at, you know, if this was really something that had happened to somebody uh, with grave consequences, um, <laughs> how they would feel about this little editorial edition being put on their story, even without any grain of truth to it. 
Well, and I think you did a great job of of even bringing it into sort of modern times because that is something with authenticity of of storytelling and journalism. I think I just think it's it, it was a great choice. And you also you made the choice to hide the main character's identity, which is why we're sort of talking around this a little bit, you know, at the beginning of the play. Now, did you go into the script knowing you wanted that to be unknown at first or did that sort of evolve as you were writing? Um, I'm not certain I knew right away, but very early on, it struck me as that the the moment of realization for the audience, I mm-hmm. think, is probably <laughs> the most fun moment uh, in, in it. Like the the minute, it I was probably it's probably only a page or two into the play mm-hmm. before you know what's going on. But, you know, I try to really couch it in the realism, the situation, the writers are from the New Yorker. It seems mm-hmm. like a real, uh, re- and then to the, that, that once that switch is flicked where you go, oh, that's what this is. <laughs> yeah. um, I think to, to not have that be part of it would really kind of take the wind out of it. Right. And I think, and, you know, even on a reread, it was funny knowing what was happening, you know, but, but. That first time, because you know, I didn't even really look at the the cover page. I just like to sort of get into them when I'm when I'm doing my first reads, and and I'm not normally a fan of gimmicks or you know like little things that try to trick the reader. But oh my goodness, it was it was a great instinct to go there, and it just adds another dimension to the humor. So definitely, it it was I think it was a, it, again it was a great instinct. So so talking about some of your other work, like who are some of your writing influences? And I know that's kind of a hard question. Whenever we ask, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so is there anyone off the top of your head that you can think of that really does influence the way you write? Yeah, um, I do have one. Um, it, it doesn't really um, it, greatly kind of connect with this specific play, mm-hmm. but maybe a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I know for me, especially growing, I, I've always sort of being a writer is something I've always wanted to do since I was a kid, but I only kind of gravitated towards um, screenwriting and playwriting um, I, I, because of the my you know affinity for dialogue and and the kind mm-hmm. of the pattern of conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, um, gro- as a kid growing up watching like the West Wing mm-hmm. and things like that, that Aaron Sorkin kind of <laughs> pitter patter of, of back and forth, um, was what I was really drawn to. There's a musicality to it oh, yeah. um, that I find really appealing. Um, I just, I, I like, I, I don't always need it to be about such high minded things as like the running of the country, maybe. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe you can take that same sophisticated uh, conversation and make it about something really stupid and small. And I, and you can see that now that you've said that influence. When I'm when I go back and I'm I'm thinking of the dialogue, it's there that that it, there is that musicality in it, and the contrast of the the sort of characters' moods, where you've got this this sort of deadpan versus the obtuse, you know, <laughs> kind of uh, journalist. It, it's there, and that's so amazing. That's amazing to hear that. Do you primarily write comedies, or do you write more serious? serious work I generally write more it's 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 interesting because I've kind of gone through a journey um I'm from Chicago originally mm-hmm. um and so I I did a, I, I went through the whole second city conservatory program I did sketch oh, comedy wow. and, mm-hmm. uh improv at IO um improv olympic um so I do mm-hmm. have that background um and I was always kind of as a kid kind of a, a class clown type person but um, more and more as I, you know, you know, entered my 20s, I was really more drawn to more dramatic works. And what I like best is when you're able to infuse the comedy into situations that are not otherwise strictly comedies. I, I find real life, even the most tragic, um, you know, the hardest days of my life, mm-hmm. um, there are still moments of levity. There's still moments oh, where you're going to crack a joke Um and I think that's um, that kind of blending. And you see that a lot. I think there mm-hmm. used to be, uh, you know, historically, even maybe 15, 20 years ago, there were very firm comedies and very firm um, dramas, both in terms of plays, in terms of movies, in terms of TV. And I think that line has blurred um, where there's not as many strict comedies right now. I, I've read a lot of, you know, think pieces on the right. death of the comedy and film um, and how things like Marvel making you know having humor and stuff has kind of removed comedies from being their own specific genre but at the same time i do think you're seeing comedy now being a more important part of really all stories that are being told um and i think that's 
probably, yeah, I, I think that's maybe a net, uh, a net good, but um, yeah, that's, so that's yeah. sort of, I think there's room for both in, in every piece. Definitely. And I think that, that comedies that do have a sort of serious element to them where even though we're talking in, you know, different language about it, we're talking about the same thing as in dramas and, and, and yeah, it's just another way to approach it. I love comedies that have heart and I love dramas that have some, some, <laughs> some let up, some lighter moments to let us get through that and you know, some comic Absolutely. relief. So wonderful. I love hearing that. That's what you're doing. Um, do you have any projects going on anything you want to talk to us about uh yeah um well nothing nothing that's going up imminently but right now uh my wife and i are actually working on a variety of screenplays and things one is filming in february i want to say february march oh wow um yeah so that's something that's exciting we did you know collaborate with um you know somebody that i'm collaborating on (laughs) uh, my entire life with uh is really exciting and i actually want to uh, thank her for she was the one who found this, you know, found you guys. And, and oh, wonderful. Uh, well, tell her thank you, because yeah, we so. love the script. I have to tell you, and I've already told you before, but yeah, it's it's the kind of script we dream of producing. And I mean, the pacing is perfect. The humor is perfect. But really, when I insisted that we read it out loud when we were doing our final selections, it's something we like to do. And when we got to the part about the horse, we all had to stop <laughs> because we That's could not, not breathe. Part. And it was like it was like my second or third read. And it still got me again. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I can't wait for everyone to hear it. It is it is fantastic. And that's not really a question, but a statement. But man, good job. Thank you very much. So, I particularly like that part. Yeah, it is perfect. And it's one of those where, you know, I'm a comedy writer and I sit there and I go, damn it, I almost hate him for how funny that is. <laughs> So fantastic. I'm sort of envious of this joke. Okay, so final question, and perhaps the most important, what are some tips to have a really great fall? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, it's okay, so I mean, if we're talking autumn, I think, you know, get real pumpkin-y about it. Um, yeah. Uh, really embrace the the oranges and the reds mm-hmm. and things like that. If you can go up to New England for some leaf peeping, ah. I highly recommend it. I was in Maine two autumns ago. It was lovely. Um, but really just, you know, put on a comfy, a comfy jacket. <laughs> Walk outside. If you can, like, roll around in some leaves with a big dog. <laughs> So, These are all fantastic tips. I'm in Austin, so our leaves don't change colors and we okay. don't really wear jackets. But that sounds like I'm going to have to take a trip up north and enjoy a really great fall. I encourage so. you to. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for chatting with us today, Christian. It's been a blast. Absolutely. Thank you. We know you love stories found, but have you ever sat and wondered, wow, How can I let other people know just how much I love Stories Found? Fortunately, we're here to help. Head over to storiesfound.com forward slash support. We've got a list of fun, free, or even paid ways to show your support and to help us keep paying our amazingly talented writers and actors. Soon, the whole world will know just how much you love comedy and supporting the arts. Head over to storiesfound.com forward slash support. Stories Found is now proud to present A Great Fall by Christian Masonic. Dr. Bahus Dell, the operator. Dr. Bahus Dell, the operator. Dr. Saad Dell, the operator, please. Dr. Saad Dell, the operator. Knock, knock. How are we doing today, HD? Still injured beyond all hope of recovery, Nathan. Thank you for asking. Come in. Of course. The doctors told me you're still resting, so we'll try not to take up too much of your time. We brought you a balloon. Thanks. I can't really do anything with that. Of course, of course. I'll just let it float up to the ceiling then. How about that? I see you got the early copy of next week's issue. I did. Uh, Thanks for uh, sending that over. Of course, of course, of course. So this is Alana Fairbanks. She was the illustrator for the piece. Hi, so nice to meet you. I know you mentioned on the phone you had some questions about the illustration. I did, uh, and we'll get to those in a second. Uh, So my first thought, though, is that 
instead of being the the long form news article that that I thought, you know, I was being interviewed for, it's a poem. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Because you see, when you called me up and said, "I'm Nathan Rubin of the New Yorker, and I want to do a story on your accident," and then you interviewed me for several hours and. You talked to the doctors and witnesses and then interviewed my family and basically everyone I've ever known on deep background. I guess, you know, I assumed uh, it was going to be an actual like article and include some of the stuff we talked about. Right. So, see, the New Yorker actually tells a variety of stories, including poems. When I started out, I thought it was going to be a news article, but somehow, I, I don't know, it just sort of became a poem. Just accidentally? Kind of. Okay. Uh, well, um... I don't like any of that, but we can stick a pin in it for now. Uh, let's talk about the poem. Um, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read it out loud and then we'll talk about it. Is that okay? I, for one, love hearing it. Mm, great. Mm -hmm. oh, are, are, are you sure you should be? Um... It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Okay. A Great Fall by Nathan Rubin. Here we go. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. The end. Oh, wow. It's like every time I listen to it, I get something brand new out of it. You know, it's interesting you say that, Miss uh, Fairbanks, was it? Because my first question is actually for you about the illustration you drew to accompany the poem. Please. So to recap, uh, the text of the poem, which was rather short, told us the following. I sat on a wall. I fell. Nobody could fix me. Right. Can you please tell me which part of that poem? And I still can't believe it's a poem, but which part of that poem states or even vaguely implies that I am an egg? For you see, Miss Fairbanks, the drawing you've done is that of a large cracked egg on the ground wearing jaunty clothing with kind of like a sad human face and then there's like soldiers and horses standing around just kind of shrugging <sighs> right so you see the drawing is meant to be representational i mean sure it's a drawing all drawings are representational. If you draw a picture of a dog, you're representing a dog. Oh, okay, so you get it. I think, and forgive me for speaking for you, Alana. Uh, please. I think the thinking here was, like, wouldn't it be funny, like, if instead of a person, you were, you know, an egg? Exactly. You took the words right out of my mouth. Like, instead of a mm, crumpled human body, uh, we see an egg. And instead of bleh, a lot of blood, <laughs> we see a lot of, you know, yolk. I don't understand. What's the joke exactly? Just, you know, just like eggs guys this was a serious injury that i received as a result of this kingdom's total disregard for its infrastructure you don't touch on any of that i'm going to be honest with you mr dumpty 
There wasn't a lot of interest in the poem without you being depicted as an egg person. He's right. Originally, I drew a very tasteful charcoal sketch of your face to go with the poem, and our editors were like, mm, what's this trash? Uh, but then I swapped out the charcoal sketch for the Eggman drawing, and honestly, he started crying. We all did. Well, maybe there would have been more interest in the beginning if you'd just written this as a goddamn article like you told me you were. Look, Mr. Dumpty, with all due respect, I'm a professional. You wouldn't want to see me coming over to your wall and telling you what to do up there, would you? Uh, that said, we do have one piece of advice about that for next time. Look, that wall is bullshit, okay? Ask anyone i was being perfectly safe up there i noticed you didn't include that in your poem either that thing is dangerous and people need to know about that of course of course of course of course of course was there anything else <sighs> yes so Nathan, you might remember that I was knocked unconscious as soon as I fell and didn't wake up until several days later here in the hospital. Right. That was in the notes I didn't use. Mm, dynamite. So obviously, I have no memory of the exact details of the care I received. But you said you spoke with the people on the scene and the doctors and everyone. Correct. Do you mind telling me the exact role that the king's horses played in my recovery? I'm sorry? You said all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Were the king's fucking horses heavily involved in attempting to put me back together? Because you could see where that would be a job that they're deeply unqualified for. Of course, of course. Stop that. What the fuck were these horses up to? I'm, I'm not even going to touch on the king's men who, based on your drawing, appear not to be paramedics, but rather uh, child's toy soldiers. Uh, so, uh, listen, we preface this by saying that we weren't actually there at the time. So there's no way to definitely confirm this. Right. But we can't imagine can't imagine that the horses played a large role. <laughs> I mean, the hooves alone. <laughs> right. The hooves would make it a very difficult endeavor for the horses. You're absolutely right about that. Also, they're animals. That's another good point. Mm -hmm. Our understanding is that the horses were indeed helpful in actually transporting your body to the hospital. Well, you've got to give them that. And then, like, once they were here, just, you know, hanging out at the hospital, it just seemed to make sense to put them to work. We've been assured they were not performing surgery. We want to make that very clear. It was more of stuff like if the doctor said, you know, scalpel, then the little horse would, you know, sort of trot over to the scalpel, you know, clip clop, clip clop, pick it up with its little horse mouth and then bring it over to the doctor. And horses, you know, are very fast. So they may very well have saved your life. But we're not doctors. Definitely not doctors. Journalists, we cannot stress that enough. You know what? Screw it. I give up. My life is over and I have nothing to show for it. Fine. Let the world remember me as a fucking egg. It doesn't really matter now. Uh, Humpty, we're really sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't know this article meant so much to you. If I had known, I mean, 
I probably would have still gone with the poem because it's genius, but maybe I could have added a second verse or something about the wall being bullshit. <laughs> well, that would have been nice. You know, I was hoping to use the article to get the attention of a good attorney for my lawsuit. My family's finished after this. I mean, look at me. I, I'll never be able to work again. I'll be lucky if I leave this bed. And with the medical bills, how am I going to take care of my family? How's my wife supposed to put food on the table for the kids? Oh, wow. I didn't realize you had kids. I mentioned them a lot during the interview. Yeah, but I was already working on the poem in my head. Uh, yeah. Well, I've got ten. It's a lot of mouths to feed. So, with you and your wife, that makes a dozen of you? <clears throat> Listen, maybe there's a way to make it up to you. There might be a story in this. A poor woman left destitute by her husband's accident, unable to feed her ten children. That's something. Readers could be into that. Uh, maybe that could help? Really? Uh, I mean, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's the least we could do. Question. What if instead of a house, your wife lived in, like, a big-ass shoe? You've just heard A Great Fall by Christian Masonic. It was performed for you today by Joe Lorenz as HD, Manuel Solis Bauza as Nathan, and Liz Bernstein as Alana. This episode was lovingly crafted for you by Paul Hanna and ELA Studios. If you'd like to read more of Christian's work, you can find his plays on NPX, the new play exchange. We'll have a post on our website with more information about Christian, as well as links to his website and social media pages. You can find all of that on storiesfound.com. Thanks for listening to Stories Found. We've been your hosts, Ava Love Hanna and Paul Hanna. Get more info about this week's episode, subscribe to our newsletter, or submit your own story and be a featured storyteller in a future episode. You can do all that and more on our website, storiesfound.com. Stories Found was recorded at ELA Studios deep in the heart of Austin, Texas. Texas.